first of all, with Hmong culture, like there aren't too many do's and don'ts with Hmong culture. They're pretty lax people. Um, like I remember being in the MTC with another Hmong kid and we were asking him, like, what do Hmong people eat with? Do they eat with like normal silverware like we do? Or do they eat with chopsticks? And he's like, oh, they use Hmong chopsticks. And I was like, are those some sort of like special chopsticks or something like that? And he's like, no. And he sticks up his hands and he's like, yeah, we eat with Hmong chopsticks. And I, I thought that was hilarious. But he wasn't lying. When I got to the field, like they eat with their hands. Like they love it. That's how you get, that's how you get the food. That's how you get the meat off the bone is you pick it up and you start chewing. Um, so there's really not too many like do's and don'ts cultural wise. Um, I mean, <clears throat> probably the biggest thing is really just taking your shoes off at the door pretty much and just respecting them for who they are. That's pretty much what you need to do and um, don't try to act like you know more than them in a way. You just got to be really respectful and polite and nobody will get offended. And so if a missionary or if someone who's about to serve Hmong speaking, like you don't have to worry too much about that, which was super nice for me because I didn't really have to remember too many like cultural rules. Um, for like where Hmong people come from, um, a lot of them live in like southern China in provinces like Guizhou or Guangdong. And, and there's a lot of them in Vietnam, a lot of them in Laos, a lot of them in Thailand. Um, but the reason why they're in Wisconsin is kind of interesting. Like they, in America, there's a lot of them in California, Minnesota, Wisconsin. Those are the biggest states with Hmong populations. Um, the reason why is because like in the late 60s early 70s we were in the vietnam war like everybody knows um and it's kind of really sad but Hmong people don't get the credit they deserve for what they did for us in the vietnam war um what they did was the the cia went into the mountains like they they knew there was like a freedom loving people in those communist countries in laos and vietnam um someone who didn't necessarily get along with the communists and so they're like, we need to befriend these guys because they know the area. They know the mountains and the, and the regions around Vietnam and Laos. And so they went and they trained them to rescue down American pilots when they were bombing like the Ho Chi Minh Trail and everything like that. And um, how to like defend really important like bases or areas that the, the Americans needed to control for like an advantage or something like that. And, and a lot of Hmong people gave up their lives for it. Um, because they believed that Americans were going to win them freedom from communism and stuff like that. And so they fought alongside us. Nobody really knew that, though. I mean, they're not really in history books that we learn in high school and everything like that. They, they deserve a lot more than that. But eventually, like every person knows, we lost the Vietnam War and we pulled out. And... When the communists found out that the Hmong people helped us out, they started a genocide of Hmong people. Um, that's another thing that isn't in our history books. Like nobody really knows that the Vietnamese, the communist Vietnamese, there are Vietnamese that were communists and Vietnamese that weren't, don't get me wrong. And then same with Laotians. They were good and bad. But the communists started like going up in the mountains and just killing them burning their villages down and killing innocent men, women, and children. And so the Hmong people needed to, to flee. And the only neutral country around was Thailand. And so they needed to run down the mountains, through the jungles and everything like that. And they needed to get to the Mekong River and cross it. And once they cross the Mekong River, they're in Thailand. And so a lot of them did that. But a lot of them were hunted down in the process. I mean, I remember hearing stories about Hmong people making their way through the jungles and everything like that, what they had to do to survive and stuff. And I've heard some really, really horrible stories of what's happened to their families and stuff. And things that still sometimes when I think about it make me cry because it's really sad what happened to them. And... 
even when they were crossing the Mekong River, they had babies strapped to their backs trying to get them to safety. And they would enter, start swimming in the river, and then with their babies alive, and they would get out of the water, and their babies would, would have gotten shot because they were on their back. And a lot of people lost their lives trying to get away for helping us. And once they got to, to Thailand, they, they were there as refugees for a long, long time, for like near 20 years, a lot of them were refugees. And they started coming over to America in waves because the uh, American government let them come over as like political refugees and stuff like that. And they settled in parts of California, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, and there's a lot of them in Alaska too. And so that's why they're here. And don't ask me why they're in those random states. <laughs> But they, they did a lot to get here. Um, and something really interesting, like missionary-wise, is I remember reading the Book of Mormon one day in Nephi. Um, it was talking about when they came over on the barges, or on, on the boat that Nephi built. And there was a verse that, that Nephi wrote that says, nobody will you know, essentially get to this land except by the hand of God. And it was really interesting because I really do believe that Heavenly Father led them over here so they could find the gospel because they didn't have it. They would have never had the chance to have it had they stayed. Um, and that's why I believe they're here. It's because now they can have the gospel. They can have happiness and everything like that. So that's how they got here. <laughs> um, what they believe in, essentially... Um, Hmong culture is really interesting. It's kind of, it's not atheistic, but they don't have a god. Um, they don't really believe in a god. They don't believe in, in like, a savior or anything like that. Um, what they have are, are shamans. Uh, shamans are, like, a spiritual leader in a way. In each clan of Hmong people, there's only 18 clans in Hmong, and that's their last name. Um, each clan has a shaman in like each of their individual areas wherever they live in cities and stuff like that and the shaman would pretty much take care of them like their spiritual needs in a way like if they got sick it meant that a part of their spirit was led away by an evil spirit and the reason why you're sick is because you're missing a part of you and so what the shaman would do is they would come over they would perform like this certain ritual and then once the ritual kind of worked out, they would be, they would like go into the spirit world and they would find the evil spirit and they would barter with it to get the spirit back. And usually the bartering takes like a sacrifice of an animal or something like that. And so it's really interesting because it's kind of like the law of Moses in a way where they would sacrifice like, like an animal to to like be cleansed or something like that. Hmong people would sacrifice an animal to get better. Most oftentimes they would sacrifice maybe like a chicken, um, sometimes a, a pig, and on really rare occasions, like on serious occasions, they might sacrifice a, a cow or something like that. And, and once they do that, the evil spirit could give the spirit back and then the person can, can get better and stuff like that. And, so that, that was like the, the point of a shaman. Um, they also believe in like animism in a way, like spirits being everywhere. And like I remember one of the ways we found a Hmong house was we always saw spirit paper hanging above their door. Um, spirit paper has like a bunch of different uses. Um, one of the use would be like to bring financial success to the family and those spirit papers were pretty easily like You could see them and like know what they were for and everything like that. They were silver and, and tan And then the ones that were there to like keep out bad spirits were like red. They had red diamonds on them and Red and gold in a way and they would hang that right above their front door and then most of the time you would see corn hanging outside as well um, every now and then you might see some weird little cross stitching of like wood hanging on their door. Um, <clears throat> I found a dog skull hanging on a door. I found horns 
hanging on a door like from a goat or from something that had like spiral horns and so i've seen a lot of things hanging on doors um and those things are to to keep out bad spirits from their home and stuff like that and it's just really interesting like trying to teach those people about about god that have no prior belief in god and it was it was a lot of fun very very challenging to teach a people that that don't have any foundation with like a higher being or anything like that but it was definitely rewarding when you were able to find somebody who believed in god family is like super important to them um it's really interesting because I remember teaching younger kids um, that are around our age as missionaries, and they'd be super interested in learning about God and everything like that. But their parents would be so dead set against it that they would disown them if they ever joined a church. And that's because if they're, they're really ancestral, like they have ancestral worship and everything. And if the younger people start going to church, it means they can't take care of them after they're gone and their spirit would be lost forever. And so the younger generation gets a lot of pressure because they wouldn't be able to take care of their elders once they're gone. And so the elders would always pressure them, say, hey, you can't join a church. If you join a church, you're done. Like you're out of this family for good. We won't talk to you. Nothing we will pretend like you don't even exist. And so it's super hard to find somebody who's willing to commit to becoming a member of the church because of that, because they're afraid of what their family would do to them. But the thing is, is I really see that as something really good in a way, because that means their family is so important to them that they, they love them enough to take care of them. They love them enough to, to do what they say. They love them enough to trust them and they want to be with their family forever um just one thing that i felt like it was kind of sad that i never really got to teach people very much because they would already shut the door on us is that you know even though you might be cutting yourself off from your family this is the greatest opportunity or this this is the greatest chance that they have to being with their family forever for eternity if eventually they were baptized and sealed in the temple they could be together forever in peace and happiness and and it just kind of saddens me that I didn't get that opportunity to teach too many people about that because they didn't want to talk to us because of the pressure that they received from family. And so that was pretty hard on us as missionaries.